So welcome to the inaugural webinar in our series Investment Mediation Insights. I'm glad to see so many familiar names on the attendee list here and also new friends interested in learning more about investment mediation. So how did we get here to this webinar series? Um, in 2018, Exit complemented its existing facilities for settlement of investment disputes by adding a set of mediation rules for investor state mediation. In addition, we've had a pretty busy summer here at Exit, um, adding two new papers. One is a background paper on investment mediation, and one is a treaty analysis that Anna will share a bit more about it uh, on mediation provisions in investment treaties. We've also provided training for investor state mediators for the past five years. We had the pleasure working together with Alejandro to provide training to experienced mediators on investment disputes on an annual basis. And we've also provided training for government officials on a mediation that was sponsored by the Energy Charter Secretariat. So thanks again for that, Alejandro. We've added a series of blogs on investment mediation and now our webinar series. Today is the first episodes, episode um, of six. And what is the goal um, of the series? And that is to feature practical insights in investment mediation. Investment mediation is no longer just a good idea for the future, but it's actually happening. And we want to feature policymakers that negotiated instruments providing for mediation and participants, parties, council, mediators who have been involved in actual real investment mediation. So today we start on a policy level. On the one hand, Anna will walk us through an analysis of provisions on mediation in treaties. And on the other hand, Alejandro, General Counsel at the Energy Charter Secretariat, will share with us insights of the research he did um, that culminated in the model instrument that states may turn to to identify aspects to consider when encouraging mediation uh, in domestic legislation. So more detailed information on our speakers is available on our website. And Damon, as I'm speaking, Damon will put a couple of links in the chat um, for further reading if that is of interest to you. How are we envisioning um, today's session? So we'd like it to be an informative and yet informal chat um, today. So at any point, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll pick them up um, as we go along. Um, or you can also raise your hand and our invisible host, uh, Damon, will unmute you at a convenient time so that we engage in the conversation. So with that overview on format and background of how, how we got here, let me start out, Anna, with you. So you've done an analysis um, on treaty provisions providing for mediation. So tell me, tell us a bit more about the research. What was the context? What were the objectives? Sure, thank you, Franca. Um, so yes, we did, uh, we've done extensive research on dispute clauses that provide for mediation. Um, and our objectives for this research were threefold. Um, firstly, we wanted to ensure that we, as an institution, have a clear understanding of the extent to which mediation is actually provided for in existing treaties today, uh, which is important to understand as we continue to progress our work in facilitating uh, mediation of investor state disputes. Secondly, we wanted to provide a resource for those who may be seeking to draft treaty provisions that provide for mediation of investor state disputes. We thought that detailing the commonly adopted approaches that treaty drafters have taken so far could be provide a useful background to treaty drafters seeking to embark on that process now. And importantly, in light of that second objective, our analysis was limited not just to treaties explicitly providing for mediation, but also looked at other ways in which amicable, amicable dispute resolution mechanisms such as consultation and conciliation have been incorporated into treaties dispute resolution clauses. We reasoned in this regard that drafting mechanisms utilized in those contexts could readily also be utilized in clauses providing for mediation in some manner. And thirdly, our research um, was provided to the Answer Trial Secretariat as part of EXIT's activities in support 
of the reform discussions of working group three. So that was a, fur a further objective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amicable dispute settlement is being picked up by the working group three on investor state reform. And in that context, um, there is another paper that recently was published um, looking at background on investment mediation and the clauses. Oh, it's a lot of objectives. Um, interesting context, Anna. So tell us more about um, uh, methodology. How did you go about it? Sure. So, well, uh, as is my want, um, our analysis was more qualitative than quantitative, and there is some interesting quantitative research out there. Um, but what we did is we gathered the complete dispute clauses from nearly 350 treaties and model BITs, and these were taken from a data set that was approximating 1,000 treaties. Um, and the treaties and model clauses that we selected uh, were selected to ensure a broad range of geographies, a broad range of time periods um, were covered. And we also wanted to ensure that all clauses we knew of that provide for mediation in some form were incorporated into our data set. And once we had that, that raw data, um, we reviewed the text qualitatively to note commonalities, uh, differing approaches and shifts and trends over time. It sounds like a broad basis of treaties you looked at. So what were your main findings? So we, we had findings um, on a number of points, but I think it's, well, it's difficult to summarize in, in five minutes or so, um, 40 years of treaty practice, there are some core themes and trends that I can tell you about. Mm. Um, so firstly, and this will be of no surprise to anyone, over the last 25 to 30 years, there's been a gradual trend to move away from the older style of this state dispute settlement clause. You know, that's the clause where um, parties would simply provide for the submission of a dispute to, for example, exit um, for resolution by arbitration or conciliation at the investor's election. Increasingly, there's been express provision in treaties for amicable dispute resolution within these disputes clauses. And the last decade in particular has seen a real increase in clauses that expressly provide for mediation as uh, the or one of the potential means for amicable dispute resolution. And then broadly speaking, the clauses in that category that we've identified um, can be fit themselves placed into five subcategories, um, which I can explain, but do interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Anna. So you saw an evolution on that amicable settlement approach in treaties and group them now in five five categories, I think I heard you say. That, that's right. Yeah. So the first- Why don't you um, walk us through? Yeah. Of course. The first is uh, clauses that contain an amicable dispute uh, period, which is often called uh, referred to as a calling off period. Um, and potentially a bare direction that the party should seek amicable settlement prior to the institution of the arbitration. And, and clauses like this typically will make the initiation of arbitration contingent only upon the dispute having not been resolved um, during the amicable settlement period. So these clauses um, are silent as to the particular mechanism or process that the parties might use to achieve amicable settlement. They don't affirmatively require the parties to do anything. All that's required is that the, the cooling off period elapses before an arbitration can be brought. That's why a cooling off rather than amicable settlement, maybe. Perhaps. So what was your se second category? So these clauses go a little further in that they expressly permit mediation or another um, amicable dispute resolution mechanism. Um, so clauses in this category will direct that disputes be resolved amicably if possible. But we'll also go further and include either a reference to um, the generic non-binding third party procedure, which is a concept that obviously would include mediation, or they may also include an explicit reference to mediation itself. And you know, in our view, these, these clauses um, give parties a steer a little bit more towards third party procedures generally, or even mediation specifically, to provide further encouragement for the use of mediation. Mm -hmm. That was the second. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, so the third category uh, goes a little further than that. It includes language like those in the second uh, category that I've just mentioned, but they also include further language that can be seen to affirmatively encourage the use of mediation or another amicable re dispute resolution mechanism. Um, and there are a, a number of ways that they can do this. Some mm -hmm. will provide specific conditions or milestones that must be achieved with respect to the amicable dispute resolution mechanism. 
Um, and an example of that would be imposing a time frame with when, within which the designated and the full dispute resolution mechanism must commence. So, for example, in um, the ASEAN Comprehensive Investment Agreement, it is required designated uh, and the dispute resolution mechanism must be commenced within 30 days of an investor requesting that it, that it start. And another way to place the finger on the scale in, this, in the third category of clauses is to stipulate the state party to the dispute must give favourable consideration to a request for mediation. Mm -hmm. So you have a bare minimum of amicable settlement, you have mentioning of mediation and non-binding, and then you have a third category of encouraging the use of mediation with different ways and tools, legislative tools, basically reflected in the treaties. And um, I should add here, Damon has posted the link um, to the paper in the chat. So if you like to look at um, specific language um, of these provisions, uh, then you could um, uh, consult the paper. Okay, we have three categories, but you mentioned five. So what is the next? So the fourth um, gets a little bit more up the scale towards um, towards mediation. In fact, it's, it's the furthest that we get. Perhaps it's it's clauses that um, effectively mandate mediation or another amicable dispute resolution mechanism. So clauses in this category um, can include language that affirmatively affirmatively imposes an obligation on both parties to undertake mediation or another amicable dispute resolution mechanism. And an example of that would be seen in uh, the Comesa Investment Agreement and the Costa Rica UAE EIT from 2017. But other types of clauses also fall within this category, including clauses that have language that make arbitration conditional on specified um, amicable dispute resolution process actually having taken place. Um, clauses that include language that make the designated amicable dispute resolution procedure actually mandatory for the investor at the state's election. And one yeah. that example there is the Australia Indonesia that we've often heard that, about. That's right. So the two recent um, Indonesian comprehensive economic partnership agreements, Australia Indonesia from 2019 and uh, Indonesia Korea from 2020 um, provide for that. And we also have um, an example of that in the Mauritius UAE VIT, which provides for consultations initially um, and thereafter makes mediation or conciliation mandatory for investors if the state wishes to pursue that. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. It's uh, different regions of the world, parties from different regions also involved in this treaty. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So we have four categories um, where mediation is sort of increasingly um, on the table or on the radar prior to arbitration, right? We're talking about that from a temporal perspective. Mm -hmm. and what is the fifth? So the fifth category is, um, it differs in terms of its structure, uh, and that is categories that um, really just provide that the parties can agree to mediation. So it's not mandatory, but can agree um, to it at any point in the dispute resolution process. So this could be prior to a dispute arising, um, during the amicable, uh, amicable settlement period, or even during the course of the arbitration. And these clauses are usually st often standalone um, from the other dispute resolution clause. Um, so these are, I think, reflect the flexibility of mediation that can go beyond you know, the formal dispute process, um, but they don't make it mandatory at any point. Mm -hmm. in and sort of looking at it as a as an alternative or complement rather than as a precondition, it sounds like. Correct, correct. I mean, there's no reason, of course, why the two com the two approaches couldn't be combined. Um, mm -hmm. We have not seen that so far in these treaties. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. Thanks, Anna. And um, when you look at the mediation provision, is there anything on procedure? Is it similar to what we see in arbitration that they reference frameworks or regulate specific aspects of process? I think on the whole procedure of mediation where a treaty provides for it is not regulated um, extensively in many treaties. There are a few exceptions to that. Um, some treaties will uh, seek to regulate certain aspects, for example, the commencement of the mediation process or how the mediation um, interacts with other proceedings that might be afoot at the time the mediation commences. Um, but generally, I think there is a lack of um, specific prescription regarding how the process should occur 
likely because these are things that parties can agree to, including by um, incorporating, um, agreeing to apply uh, mediation rules that exist. So, for example, as you know, um, <laughs> as our author of our mediation rules, we have um, a complete set of mediation rules that, that address the procedure of a mediation. Mm -hmm. um, what we haven't yet seen, and this may reflect the timing and the existence of appropriate uh, mediation rules, we haven't yet seen um, significant treaties incorporating mediation rules uh, within their disputes clauses. Um, but obviously that's something that can be done uh, just in the way that uh, treaties often incorporate specific uh, arbitration rules when they mm -hmm. provide for arbitration of disputes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I see. So if you look at um, your research as a whole, what, what are different points? Do you have some checklist for policymakers or drafters? What are points to consider? Sure, when including um, it's a great question and it's, you know, for those who want to read the paper, it's something that is addressed towards the end of it. Um, but there are a number of things I think that are most important. When to make mediation available within the continuum, the investment conflict continuum whether it should be throughout, um, whether it should be a component of the dispute resolution process within a um, time frame or um, something different, whether to mandate it, whether to require either both parties to participate in the mediation or alternatively make it mandatory at one or other of the parties' elections, or whether to make it only by agreement. And, and if to make it, if the decision is to make it only by agreement, um, whether any additional language should be included in the clause to sort of place the finger on the scale of encouraging mediation more. Um, if there is an amicable dispute resolution period specified, which typically there will be, what the duration of that should be. Um, and lastly, what regulation to include the process, if any, um, whether there should be written notice requirements and how prescriptive to make those. Um, whether there should be a requirement in the treaty of regulating uh, a response to a request for mediation, um, whether the treaty should include a designated agency provision which specifies which agency within a state a request for mediation or a notice of dispute should be sent, um, and what other regulation might be included, including um, whether to uh, stipulate that a mediation under the particular clause should be governed by a set of mediation rules. Um, the advantage of doing that, of course, is to ensure that there are no procedural lacunae um, for a mediation that arises. Um, and of course, mediation rules can potentially be updated over time to reflect emerging practice, whereas you know, treaties once agreed to and signed, of course, remain stagnant in terms of their content. Mm. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for that overview and sort of summary at the end of the of the points um, that you saw uh, to sort of synthesize um, all of that. And um, I see in the chat we have one question about um, uh, exit proceedings on conciliation and arbitration combination. And I can say that um, uh, the way the, the sequence obviously is, and I can see it in the chat already, is that um, it's, a dis it's a tier dispute settlement clause that provides for conciliation before arbitration can be commenced. Um, that um, we are working on model clauses, that is true for mediation or conciliation and arbitration um, that then will complement our new rules, um, exit arbitration rules amendments as well. Uh, we leave that generally up to the parties, what they consider is the most effective in terms of drafting of clauses for contracts, uh, that is what I have in mind, um, whether they wish to have the tier or whether they wish, as Anna explained in the fifth category, mediation as an option alongside um, the arbitration. And now maybe I can pick up one question from the chat. Um, is there, um, did you see anything in the treaty on enforcement of mediation settlements? Are there uh, specific provisions? I don't recall off the top of my head provisions regarding the enforcement of settlement um, agreements arising out of mediation. Um, that of course is something that the parties could incorporate, part, treaty parties could incorporate. It's also something that um, can be addressed in the future by um, choices as regards uh, specific mediation rules to apply. Um, so for example, it is possible under the exit mediation rules um, where the, the dispute would also be 
open within jurisdiction to an exit convention um, arbitration proceeding for potentially a, um, a settlement to then be uh, a settlement in the context of an ex outstanding arbitration to be incorporated into an exit convention award, which would obviously um, give certain benefits as regards to enforceability. And of course, I'm sure participants on the call are, are well aware of the Singapore Convention on the Enforcement of um, Settlement Mediation to Settlement Agreements. Um, and so that is something the parties to treaties could consider in terms of their own decisions to as to whether to join that, that treaty or not. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can add from statistics um, from exit arbitrations that have settled. Uh, presumably, there was a robust dispute settlement clause for non-compliance with settlement agreement. And out of the about what 300 original arbitrations um, that have settled so far, uh, only about a handful, five came back um, for an arbitration later on. So that seems to suggest that um, compliance is very high once a deal is reached. Uh, we also have a question on um, specific mediation process uh, that might be helpful to not over-regulate it to allow the flexibility here. And let me add from the exit mediation rules, um, that is entirely our goal. When you see how much process uh, provisions deal with the process when it's, once it's underway, there are different um, tools the mediator can use, obligations on the parties, but flexibility was indeed um, the, the very high goal there. Did you see that too, Anna, in the treaty analysis, flexibility on process? Well, as I mentioned, there's, in, there's actually very little regulation of process. There is a, a small number of treaties um, which contain an annex that seeks to uh, regulate process. But those really, I mean, the, the provisions in those handful of examples go more towards initiation of the procedure appointment of mediator and less so towards what, once the mediation is up and running, the mediator and the parties can, should, should be doing. So I think it's, it's still less prescriptive there. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you for your patience. And um, now we turn over to you. We've um, covered mediation development on the international level, and now we'll look a, a bit more on the domestic legal framework. Is there something else that can be done to encourage the use of mediation? What What is your research and what have you found? Um, thanks, Roque. It's very interesting to to join this first debate, uh, always interesting to discuss with all those participants on investment mediation. And the short answer is yes, I think there is a lot that can be done. It's very useful to have the international legal framework, but it's not very helpful if you don't have the internal mechanism to be able to use it in a, an effective way. Um, so we also conducted our research. We also did a survey in 2017, uh, a more practical one. We went to the government officials dealing with investment disputes and we tried to find out why there was not so many investment mediations, why there were concerns and their obstacles to actually uh, go investment mediation or even negotiation. And the main concern that it was raised uh, amongst all government officials was the lack of a clear domestic framework. That was the main issue. And this issue um, triggered or resulted in three main drawbacks. The first one is ambiguity. Uh, there is no clear authority to actually mediate or even to sit down with the investors and say, okay, let's negotiate this. Can I? Many people were not sure about that one. Um, An ambiguity in the sense of who is in charge? Lack of on clarity or and level? complete mm -hmm. absence of, uh, of the framework saying, okay, in case of this potential dispute, um, the ministry or whoever can actually settle or negotiate. So, uh, in case of doubt, of course, uh, current officials take hands off and will not get involved. And this is linked to the second drawback. Uh, why do that? Because they are afraid of potential issues of allegation of fraud, corruption, uh, abuse of authority. Um, you have the ministry saying one day, all these foreign investors, I can't believe, not safety measures, no investments, a lot of problems. And then a couple of following uh, months later, there's an agreement and then, wow, what, what has happened? So um, on the one hand, not having the clear authority whether they can uh, settle or mediate and link with the, let's say, fear of potential allegations uh, is what, you know, really keep them uh, considering mm -hmm. really to enter or not into any mediation or negotiation. 
And this, of course, is linked with the third issue, which is the question of money. Uh, you know, money is almost everywhere. So, um, yes, you may want to go mediation, but then is who pays the travel, who pays the stay in that other place for the mediation, who advance money for mediators. Some countries have already some regulation to cover the cost for arbitration, but for mediation, it's not very clear. So, mm -hmm. the result is, yes, there seems to be a need to have a domestic framework. And very clearly within that domestic framework, the main key thing is to have a clear and express legal basis to go mediation negotiation. Yes, uh, government officials can mediate. Yes, it's possible to negotiate. Don't worry, it's not against the constitution. It is in line with the obligations of the state. That's possible. And this is the authority uh, for settling. This is the person you can refer to. And these are the mechanisms for covering any potential uh, financial arrangements and everything. So. Mm. And when you talk about financial arrangements, you're talking still about process, right? Not settlement as such, any yeah, I mean, compensation yeah. or any payments to investor or to the state, but just to go about procedure. Exactly. So there are the two components. The first one is the more immediate one, which is how can I secure the financial to go wherever to sit down actually with investors because it may not be in the same country and actually conduct the mediation and to pay the advance uh, for the institution or for the mediators, etc. And the other thing that's also quite linked and will come later is uh, to what extent, how can I secure later if there's an agreement, the funding and the approval for that funding, etc. So that's that's the key thing. So we so yes, there is a real need for a domestic framework. Yes, there is international framework, but to make sure this really effective and used, you need to have an internal basis. And what we did is in 2018, just after that one, we uh, sit down with institutions, World Bank, including Nixit, of course. Thank you very much, Roque, and uh, UNCTAD, UNCTRAL, ALCO, and different, different government officials. So we sit down those who are daily basis dealing with disputes and say, what is the real practical issues, the main concerns? And we try to come with how they address those concerns and provide some tips. And that's the model instrument on managing investment. Oh, you're muted, Alejandro. Could you unmute? Yeah, Good. I, I, I tried to send through the chat, the link to the model instrument and what I did is I mute myself. So um, <laughs> uh, now it's both things working, hopefully. Yeah, we got uh, it. So the model instrument and that you see in the chat, uh, a link to the different languages, is a guide. It's a guide the states can use uh, when they want to develop or update or find their um, um, work on their existing framework, uh, especially taking into account how to make an effective use of mediation, because there are some already documents that are more focused on arbitration, how to mm -hmm. make sure that also covers mediation and anything needed for mediation. Um, this is more sort of a guidance. We also follow the ancestral practice and call it model instrument in the sense that, you know, it can be adapted to implement it anyway. There are different states. It can be our a regulation can be a decree, the law, whatever fits better for that particular government. But mm -hmm. the main idea is to provide with some tips, some practice, what work from some government officials and different policy options that the state can uh, choose, what is the best mix work for, you know, taking into account their circumstances, um, economic situation, organization, legal, cultural background, you know, all the states are the same. Um, some states want to make difference between uh, trade dispute and investment disputes, others want to mix them. So it's just a, a guidance for them to have a look into and they can um, bring some interesting options there that they can develop their own their own domestic practice. And you develop that by looking at existing legislation and the uh, conversations with government officials. Am I getting that right? Yeah, we, we, we first look at the um, domestic legislation. We didn't find too much there. Um, we found a couple of documents that were quite useful, again, everywhere around the world. So there were some in Latin America, some in Asia, um, actually less in Europe and in Africa. Um, and and with, with that and the actual concerns that we raised through the talks with government officials is when we came with those particular tips and those particular, mm -hmm. hopefully, helpful um, policy options that they can take into account. Okay, let's dive in. So, what are the policy options? What are the features that you came to put together? Okay, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a long document. Uh, we are aware of that one because, of course, it 
tries to address as many practical issues as possible. Um, mm. It also contains some provisions to help with prevention of disputes. Uh, but if we look at investment mediation, you know, what are the main features there? There are four main issues. The first one will be uh, to establish a responsible body and to have a unit, a ministry, an interministerial committee, you name it, you just shape it as you want. But an institution you know is going to be responsible, is the coordinator. Investment disputes are very complex. You involve different authorities. It's difficult to get the relevant information, the documents, the experts, and to coordinate to have a single world. So to have a single institution, that's the key. And then of course designated said, agency. So to call it, this yeah, different names up. there, responsible body, designated agency, mm -hmm. leading agency, it doesn't matter. The question is to have someone investors not refer to, and within the government, they also know who is in charge, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, there's another one which is we thought very important, and is to have an early assessment of the dispute. So we saw in many cases uh, countries receive the notification and then just ran how to prepare for the arbitration. They look for the lawyers, they start thinking who can be the arbitrator. Hey, hold on. I mean, have you thought maybe, you know, it's a question of matter of time, money, you're not so sure you're going to win. Have you thought maybe mediation is useful? Have you considered negotiating with investor? Maybe part of the dispute, not all. So to really have an assessment, is it worth in this case really focus on arbitration or any other mechanism can also be, you know, even more useful. Um, so we thought, that was quite important. And there is another a very interesting feature, and it appears, of course, in arbitration, but even more in mediation, and is how to deal with that tension between confidentiality and transparency. Um, of course, investment disputes attract public opinion, media, uh, political attention, and on the other hand, you also, some states have the legal obligation to be transparent and to publish agreements and any other information. Uh, so how to deal with that one? And we provide some input there, some tips, and in particular, we advise the need to have an early strategic communications plan and a spokesperson. Mm -hmm. So to know how you're going to deal with dealing with the media, with dealing with the stakeholders, how are you going to explain the case and how to deal in case the investor is the one who is dropping information or on the contrary, the investor doesn't want to, but you are forced to. So how to deal with those situations? And finally, and, and, and not less important, uh, to try to have a centralized and consistent database. What were the main problems experienced by the country in the past? And what did work, what did not work as a potential tools to deal with those disputes? This helps to gather to, data for yeah. policy making, decisions, yeah. reassessing. It's, it's a centralized database that you know those involved with disputes or legislation can can access, and then you can see what were the main issues, where are the main problems in the past, um, in the sense of uh, measures of the government or a piece of legislation which triggered the problems, the conflicts, the disputes. What was used as a potential solution in that case? Work it not. And that helps you, um, in particular, first to understand whether for this situation mediation could work. Did it work in the past? Did it not work in the past? And second, if you go to mediation, what can you put on the table? What can you offer? What can you consider as a potential solution? If you have an idea of what worked in the past, you know you have more to really put into the table uh, and to brainstorm. Mm -hmm. um, of mm -hmm. course, we have more um, provisions uh, trying to help in identifying who can be the legal experts or the external um, lawyers that may or may not be the same as for the investment arbitration, and also to help having a stakeholders mapping to try to really identify who are the key players that have something to say or have some importance in the development of the, of the mediation. But I think those were the main four features we identify as a key uh, for, for investment mediation. Mm -hmm. And thanks, Alejandro. And I mean, if you think of it, of the the multitude of disputes that can arise within a state of the different branches of government of different levels, um, then I think uh, that just underlines how helpful it is to have a lead agency responsible body and also this data gathering uh, mm -hmm. that you mentioned at the end. So um, from your experience, um, how many countries actually have something like this already in place? Not, not many. So 
it's true that some countries have some sort of lead agency or responsible body, um, but uh, not many have it. And it normally the domestic uh, framework doesn't go farther than that. You can only mm -hmm. find a couple of countries where it is a bit more detailed, uh, but it normally stops in having just uh, a, a lead agency uh, and sometimes it's not even known. And that's an important issue here that, you know, even having a domestic framework is not enough. So trying to squeeze your brains to come with a perfect domestic framework is not really helpful. If later it is not aware and is not well known by anyone, you have seen some countries who have a very developed domestic framework, very detailed, mm -hmm. but then you ask different government officials and they have no clue first that domestic proceedings, I mean, the domestic framework exists or who is actually the agency or the agency, uh, actually there is only one person. So having the domestic framework without a clear um, raising awareness about it and all those involved having a clear understanding on how it works, when it works, who is the right person and capacity building um, mm -hmm. activities on that, that's really not a very useful. So uh, it's, it's really important to not only to have the domestic framework, but also to make sure it is really going to be used. Mm -hmm. So for implementing um, and uh, making clear everybody knows how to approach it, who to turn to, that is something that we often hear that, you know, who, who do I um, turn to on the government side uh, when issues arise? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. So, so to make sure that, yes, you did the homework, you have a domestic um, framework and it may work perfectly fine, but only if people actually use it. And for that, mm -hmm. people need to know it and to be aware how it really works out. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's a key thing, I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I actually have a question for both of you, Anna and Alejandro, on that. Um, Alejandro, maybe we start with you. Um, so what do you think um, if states do not have a um, uh, comprehensive legal framework in place for mediation, can they still mediate? Um, I will say yes. Um, I mean, that's what happens now. And that will happen also with international arbitration before. Um, mediation is nothing really new. Um, it was in the past. Now, the main difference is that if you have an international and domestic framework, that is really a boost of confidence and trust. Um, mm -hmm. You may have the possibility, yes, but as we mentioned before, it was not really used because of lack of knowledge and therefore lack of trust and confidence. So having this framework, having this transparency, it really helps stakeholders to be um, confident. Okay, I know what it is. I know how it works. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's not some strange thing ongoing there. Um, so therefore, it really helps a lot to have it. Um, in addition to that one, if, if it's not possible or domestic framework is still ongoing and this is still uh, in the early stages, what can really help is to rely on the institutions. Um, you know, to go on mediation and to go, for example, exit to help administering the, the mediation, to have an institution that really can add this additional confidence and trust to make sure that what is going to happen there is something that is correct, is right, is according to the rule of law, and it's nothing strange. And you know, you can really have confidence and trust, plus to have someone that can really help you uh, to reach some agreements uh, on you know, wh wh where are you going to sit down, where are you going to be the proceedings uh, taking place, all those kind of things, institutions can really help apart from having the uh, internal or international framework. And at the Energy Charter Secretariat, you have done that, right? You also have supported um, negotiation settlement discussions in the context of energy disputes. Yeah, so we, we, we provide technical advice to countries who want to actually develop their own uh, domestic frameworks. We have second this already coming to Secretariat to work on that one. And we, of course, provide good offices and support um, both investors and states who are considering to go mediation or not uh, and to facilitate that confidence building, explanation, capacity building to make sure that, again, it's up to them to use it or not, but if they want to, they are aware and they know how to use it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anna, now thank you for your patience. I'd return back to my question. So can, I, can states and investors mediate without a treaty provision? Uh, certainly, and as you... Um... As you pointed out, Fraka, a very significant number of our arbitrations at Exit ultimately are settled. Mediation is, is really a mechanism just to assist parties to achieving a settlement. Um, so there's no 
limitation to their ability to do so. Uh, obviously, the domestic framework can provide additional support domestically and politically um, for governments, um, but there's no impediment to their doing so now. And um, you know, Exit stands by ready to assist parties in that regard. Good. Thank you. Thank you for for that um, uh, insight from both of you. Um, if we don't have any more um, questions in the chat, we have um, one I see um, that deals again um, with enforcement. Um, what if um, a state does not comply with a settlement agreement? Uh, what what then? I, I think that question is to me. Um, you know, so a settlement agreement ultimately is a contract. Um, so the parties, the parties seeking to enforce the settlement agreement will have available to it um, whatever mechanisms um, are provided for under the applicable law um, to that contract. And of course, that contract itself may contain and, and probably should contain a dispute settlement clause. Um, and I certainly, when I was in practice, had some some cases involving um, the enforcement of a settlement agreement. Um, so the, there are ways parties can address that as part of their settlement agreement. Um, and also, as, as I mentioned um, earlier, um, in certain contexts, it might be possible for a settlement to form um, part of an exit arbitration award where that settlement is achieved in the context of an existing arbitration. Um, so that's obviously a limited um, of limited application because it requires firstly that there be an exit convention arbitration um, available to the parties, but that is a way that parties can ensure themselves of enforce enforceability. Thanks, Anna. Alejandro, um, that yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Now, in, in, in the same line, we, we have something in the model instrument. We, we try to, there's a couple of provisions about enforcing settlement agreements, um, you know, um, who can uh, within the government and outside in the in the, in, in other governments? Um, how to deal with that one in case there are no international instruments? Uh, yes, we have the Singapore Convention, but until it is um, working in the particular country, uh, how to make sure internally that those different agreements will be enforced and uh, how to make sure that it will work out? Um, so I think it's. Um, that's that's quite important for for the governments to have that into into account. We also at the charter conference we had a resolution by which um, the conference uh, welcomed the willingness of the states to actually comply with. And normally, uh, when the state enter into a settlement agreement, as you mentioned before, there is a high chance that the settlement agreement will be complied with. And for that to happen is very important. What we mentioned before to have a clear understanding who has the authority and which are all the mechanisms and formalities you need to comply with. And that's something that has to be on the table at the very beginning of the mediation. And to make sure that the person with authority will be there at the end of the deal, will uh, supervise the final document and will follow any required process in that particular government in the applicable law. Uh, with that one, the chances that it will not be complied or there are going to be procedural problems are really much reduced. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks, Alejandro. We got one um, additional question in the chat. Interested to know the view about arbitrators conducting mediations without much experience as mediators. Um, I certainly have a view on that. Um, I can start with it, perhaps, um, that it's uh, really important to understand that mediation is not an informal arbitration, but as Anna and Alejandro shared, it's a facilitation of negotiation. So it's a very different skill set that is required to facilitate negotiations, whereas um, arbitrators rule um, on the basis of the applicable law. So, in my view, um, it's only recommendable that mediators are chosen who have a lot of experience and practice mediating. Uh, um, Anna, Alejandro, do you have um, thoughts to add? Alejandro, you are still on my screen. Why don't we start with you? Yeah, I, I do. I do agree with you. I think mediation and arbitration are different methods and different processes, and, and you need different skills. And, and that's one of the reasons why. Uh, we we saw that there was a, a lack of confidence of some government officials. Okay, let's go mediation, but who is going to sit down there? We hear many concerns about um, you know arbitrators. So what will happen with the mediators? And that's why we came with ICSID and CADR with the idea of having a, a training 
or invest in mediators to make sure that the persons with the right skills will be there because it's not exactly the same thing. And you have to avoid having someone who will try to conduct a mediation like if it were an arbitration, because then all the benefits and advantages maybe get lost in the process. Anna, do you have anything to add? Um, I would just say, I guess there's no reason in principle why an arbitrator could not have the skill set um, needed to be a mediator. But I certainly can't imagine that I would have confidence that that would be true if that person did not have significant experience in mediation. And I think what we typically see is um, there is a division. There are, there are different groups of people really focus on those two different areas. Um, so that it would not be my first recommendation, certainly. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. I see we are um, up with our time and we wanted to honor that. Uh, so thank you for all participants. Thank you for Anna and Alejandro to join um, today and share your really foundational research that will help us uh, in the development of the field. And we certainly hope um, uh, our participants found this informative and we enjoyed having you uh, join us here. And we look forward to welcoming you at our second episode in the series of webinars um, that will take place on October 27, where we will talk about mediation and arbitration. Should they be separated? Could they be combined? And that um, panelist will feature Joe Tirado and Anne Karin Grill, um, both of whom have experience as counsel in investment arbitration and are also experienced mediators who have in fact mediated investment disputes. If you have any other questions like to follow up, um, please get in touch um, with us, send us an email. We'd be happy to continue the dialogue um, outside of the webinar. And so until we see you again, keep safe and be well and thank you.